Hello. We're joined today by Stephen Howard, the Advocacy Director of In Defense of Christians, one of the Armenian National Committee of America's uh, greatest coalition partners. Uh, Stephen has been with them for many years, has uh, performed uh, exceptionally well uh, for this very, very vital organization. Um, I've shared in the past, and I'd like to share again, that uh, In Defense of Christians is uh, America's answer to a century of indifference to the plight of Christians and persecuted minorities around the world. Uh, they do remarkable work. They punch well above their weight. Uh, they are uh, a voice for the voiceless abroad, but also in many ways, a voice for the voiceless here in America. They have um, given voice to a constituency of Americans who care deeply about uh, the plight of, of fellow Christians and others uh, abroad who are persecuted for their religious beliefs, but who never really had their voice heard. And now, uh, thank God, because of IBC, because of the great work that Stephen's done and his colleagues, Tufik and, and the others, uh, Sarah, uh, their voice is heard loud and clear. Uh, they have a place at the table wherever religious freedom, uh, religious persecution is discussed in the U.S. government, whether that's the executive branch, whether it's the, the legislative branch, state governments all around the country. They have, in very short order, uh, gone from zero to 60 in like 2.4 seconds, uh, a remarkable organization uh, with a remarkable team. Uh, I, I, I can't speak highly enough uh, of Stephen. Uh, we've been in the trenches together uh, for, for years, uh, fighting so many battles together. We'll go into some of those in a moment, but I'd just like to, to, to thank you, Stephen, for being with us today and, and to invite you to tell us a bit about uh, the great work of IDC and, 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 and the journey that you've taken with this, with this wonderful organization. Oh, definitely. And Aram, it's an honor to be with you. I've been with IDC for just a little over four years now. And you know, over the course of the time that we've been in those trenches fighting together for things such as the recognition of, of genocide uh, by ISIS against minorities in Iraq and Syria, you know, successful advocacy for congressional recognition of the Armenian genocide, uh, working with, with, um, with Anka and with you has been one of my by far the best parts about uh, my, my, my work with IDC. It's very rewarding. And I think coming and joining the organization too, as a young person, as a young advocate, um, I've just really enjoyed looking up to you and to your organization. Uh, and I've learned so much from you about how to advocate for, for Christians who are persecuted across the region. So it's meant a lot. And I know that for IDC in general as an organization, all of, all of the successes that we've been able to accomplish in our work is very much connected with everything that you all have done uh, at the ANCA. And I know that every time I talk to our president, Tofik Baklini, he always tells me, you know, that you're his brother. And so that make that makes you my uncle. And I take that, I take that very seriously. And, um, but it, it, it has been a pleasure of the work that we have done and, uh, you know, everything since, you know, 2014, when the organization was started responding to that, to that genocide against minorities. And, you know, your, your group, Anka, came up big in that, in that campaign. You really um, stood in solidarity with, with, with Christians, Yazidis, and, and other minorities who, who were victims of that genocide. Because uh, who really understands the plight of, of, uh, of genocide, really? And, you know, it's, it's very few people groups that have suffered um, the way that the Armenian community has, especially over the last century. And I think that the way that you've all been able to advocate not only for yourselves, but stand in solidarity with others has been really impactful. So um, the work that we've done together has been historic and I can't wait to see what the next you know decade will, will show for our, for our groups. Even when, when IDC was first founded, I mean, right out of the box, you took on like the heaviest of heavy lifts and the, the designation of genocide uh, against persecuted uh, Christians in the Middle East uh, in Syria and Iraq by ISIS and another uh, extremist. That was an extremely heavy lift given the powerful institutional forces that like resist designations of genocide. And you did not shy away from that at all. And 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 even some of the our, our most devoted friends, uh, our, our personal friends and organizational allies, you know, doubted, is this possible? Why are you, you know, uh, sort of reaching so high? And, and, uh, and you guys delivered. You delivered uh, by being like principled, by being persistent, by being very professional. And I think that was in many ways a watershed moment in US foreign policy. You, you uh, helped helped America. In a sense, we served the persecuted, right? But we served America as well by helping America become the kind of nation that lives up to its creed, that, um, that we don't just talk the talk about, oh, the poor uh, folks abroad who are being uh, you know, uh, uh, persecuted for their, their faith. Uh, no, now we turn that into policy. And that's really been a remarkable thing. I, 
I, I, I think I shared at one of the banquets, um, uh, IBC banquets some years ago, that IBC does the work of the Lord in the language of legislation. And that's really vital. Uh, and you also teach others uh, that, that, that how, much, how very much is possible. And that might be like the most powerful lesson you can give in politics, which is to, to help people understand what is possible, that, you, that we can work in concert toward these very, very worthwhile aims uh, and they're all heavy lifts. They're tough ones. I mean, you're, uh, you know, we'll talk about the countries that you're dealing with here. These are heavy hitters. These are countries with very, very serious influence in D.C. But IDC is going out and saying, look, uh, we're going to improve the situation for per the persecuted and we're going to deal with these, these geopolitical realities. But we're not going to uh, surrender. We're not going to um, retreat. We're going to go forward. And, and it's been just a really a legacy now of seven years of steady progress. And I think it's just just remarkable. Maybe maybe we could touch on some of the areas that so the new battles uh, that are um, that, that lie ahead. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, it, it very well said, Aram. And uh, this year, and really just in general, I, I really divide IDC's work in, into into three different categories that that I'll go into. And and the work that the um, that the ANCA that you do intersects with each of them. So I'll allow you to kind of chime in and share about the important work that the ANCA has, uh, has played in leading um, advocacy in DC for each of these areas. Um, but obviously the overall mission of our organization is to advocate for the preservation of Christianity in the Middle East. A century ago, you know, Christians were 20% of the region's population and, and today they are less than three. And, and, and your organization knows this better than anyone else, but obviously the Armenian genocide is, is obviously one of the key pivotal events uh, that that caused that intense demographic decline and so the challenge that we're facing now is that christianity is legitimately the threat of uh of becoming extinct in the very land where it was born and so part number one of our work is advocating um, for uh, christian communities uh, in the middle east in countries where they are strong and when we look you know in the middle east uh, in particular where christianity is doing well in terms of numbers uh is, is really in two countries. We see it in, in Lebanon and we see it in Egypt, that there are strong Christian communities. And what's really unique about Lebanon is that the community is, is politically empowered and, and has full equality. And Christians and Muslims have worked together in Le Lebanon to build a democratic uh, system. Uh, St. Pope John Paul II even called it a message for the world of what religious coexistence looks like. Um, unfortunately, what we're seeing today in Lebanon are the convergence of multiple factors that are leading to the possible, to serious, to a, you know, a possibly destabilization of the entire country. It could, people are concerned it could, it could implode into conflict, it could become a failed state. And so really what we have been doing uh, for the last uh, several months, uh, certainly over the course of our organization's existence, but definitely you know, in, in recent days is standing with the patriarch of the Maronite Catholic Church, as he has called for Lebanon to be uh, a neutral country uh, in the region to truly be a Switzerland of the Middle East, which will be the best way that you can incubate Lebanon from all these other conflicts that we're seeing in the region, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Iran, Saudi Arabia, Turkey, uh, calling for continued U.S. support, obviously, for the Lebanese armed forces and the role that they play in, in securing and stabilizing the country, calling for accountability um, for a new uh, for, for new. Uh, leaders uh, politically to step up. We're tired of the old political bosses and the role that they've played for humanitarian assistance as well. Uh, and so, and, and more, most recently as well, what the Maronite Patriarch has called for, and there was even a demonstration at Bekirke in Lebanon this past Saturday, um, there does need to be a UN conference uh, on Lebanon, on stabilizing Lebanon. The US and France in particular are two countries that can play a key role in stabilizing Lebanon. Uh, and then the second country, where where Christians are strong, but unfortunately not equal, uh, is Egypt, where they're approximately 10% of the population. There's probably uh, probably about 10 million Christians uh, in, in Egypt. Uh, some estimates go even higher than that, but, but that the most conservative would be 10 million. What we see is they're just second-class citizens. While there's a lot of them in Egypt, they're discriminated against. They they can't. There's entire jobs that they are are disqualified. Like they can't work in in the highest level security positions in Egypt. You there are all these permits that are required to construct churches and other permits that are required to open a constructed church that are not in place for for mosques, for example. Um, 
so and then we're also seeing issues where sometimes mobs will attack christians you know burning homes there was a tragic situation where a 70 year old woman named suet Abet was actually stripped uh, naked by by three men and dragged through the streets of a village in minia province um, in an act of public shaming because of some rumors that were circulating about her son in the community and the three men who dragged her through the streets were all acquitted and so this happens all the time people attack Christians and they don't get punished for it. So in Egypt, we're just at the message is very simple, equality, punish people who break the law, no more discrimination. Um, it's very simple. It's a very simple message. We just want our people to be treated equal. So I'll just highlight HRS 117 on Egypt, introduced by French Hill and David Siciliani, a bipartisan mm-hmm. resolution calling for a Coptic Christians to be treated equally. I want to thank you and the ANCA for the support that you've given to the resolution. And as you rightfully highlighted for Armenians, this is a big deal because for Armenians who are members of the Armenian Apostolic Church, you're in full communion with the Coptic Orthodox Church. So these these are your, your brothers and sisters in the most intimate uh, of ways. Uh, and so um, it's a great cause to advocate for. And then I'll just add, you know, we're, we're, if you move a little bit beyond the, the, the direct region, uh, we see strong Christian communities and obviously in Armenia, right? We obviously Greece, Cyprus with our, with our Hellenic partners at the Hellenic American Leadership Council. And even more recently, we're obviously we're very concerned about the situation in Ethiopia, which is home to an ancient Christian community. So a pivotal part of our work is, is working to ensure that these countries with large Christian populations are stable and, and thriving. And so your group has been pivotal to that. And, but the challenges are numerous <laughs> to say the least. Uh, Stephen, I, I know that uh, so many Armenians uh, in the U.S. Um, lived for many years uh, in Lebanon and consider Lebanon their home, uh, their homeland as much as as much as Armenia or America. They, they feel very, very deep connection. It's profound, and um, it meant a lot. I think that uh, also that the, the genocide resolutions that were passed in 2019 um, cited the Ottoman uh, Empire's genocide of the, the Maronite population. Um, in Lebanon and elsewhere in, in the Ottoman Empire. The, the, these are important, I think, connections. And I think that, you know, the concern that we have, we have we have very, very deep concern for Lebanon and share share your fears for the future uh, of Lebanon. Uh, in terms of the the, the the Coptic community in Egypt, I think IDC has really, in many ways, uh, pioneered this issue on Capitol Hill. I've been, and I think you, you as well, are very encouraged by the Coptic community, Coptic American communities organizing. I think in just the last five years or so, we've seen like really powerful organizing going on in the community. Uh, and I think that, that that's taking place in parallel to the work that IDC has done. Uh, HRES 117, I think is very thoughtful, very balanced uh, piece of, of, of legislation uh, that deserves all of our support. Um, you mentioned also the, the partnership with the Hellenic community. I mean, these are like, there's a lot of different forces here. Uh, the, the Actually, you have Hellenic, uh, family, you have the Armenian family, you have uh, those with roots in Lebanon, Maronites, and, and others. You have the, the Coptic community to that, which I think now has something like 200 or 180, 190 churches across America, uh, the Ethiopian community. Uh, it's really, uh, there are many, many constituencies that each in their own way at different levels, unevenly perhaps, uh, were expressing themselves uh, you know, on their particular issues, but now have a vehicle to, to speak together on in a common voice on on kind of the overarching theme. And that's very important because uh, the progress we can make on any given issue, given the opposition we face, is limited. But uh, as they say, the, the rising tide lifts all boats. So IBC is that rising tide. And with the strength and the growth and the, the development of IBC, we see the Armenian issue and the Coptic issue and the Ethiopian issue and the Hellenic issues and, and the Lebanese issue. And all these issues uh, rise in importance and impact in Washington. So I, 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 I want I, I to share certainly with our Armenian audience, but with everybody else, that, that uh, IDC is, is um, in a sense, uh, a coalition. It's a family, um, and uh, we all have a very, very uh, very vital place in making sure that this, this voice grows. Mm. Very well said. And it's uh, just as we, we see in Scripture, right? We see the, you know, the body of Christ. When one part of the body is hurting, we all have to come to the assistance uh, of that part of the body. And so... Um, it, it is it is a blessing to be here at the intersection where all these different communities are, are coming together. And I think what I love about your work with the ANCA and something that we really value at IBC is, you know, our issues, our policy 
and we do advocacy, but for us, you know, we're not in this, you know, for political reasons. I mean, maybe an outsider would look at it that way, but for us, this is all personal. These are, you know, our families, and in many cases, our stories, or maybe they're the stories that we've been called, or they're situations that we've been really called to push for, you know, in solidarity with those who are still being persecuted. So um, you guys have done great work on that end, and I'm, I'm proud of the work that we've been able to accomplish together um, and just promoting the nonpartisan the nature of the issues and working yeah. with both sides of the aisle on them. Um, yeah, that's nice. I didn't want to touch as well. Yeah. yeah, I'm sorry, I just I, I want to underscore that it's really been a hallmark of IDC's work to be uh, nonpartisan and, or bipartisan and to that when IDC walks into an office, they're walking into the office because of their deeply held beliefs, not because uh, they're carrying water for any political party, not because they are helping any particular politician. They have uh, an ideal and, and it's, it's at one level, it's a spiritual ideal that we all have our place. We're all God's children. And that is so powerful and so transcendent that I think um, between that, that sort of powerful message, plus the hard work uh, that all the folks do uh, on the IDC team. That's why the rest, great recipe for success. Absolutely, absolutely. And and that really carries us over into, I mean, the, the, the next um, issue I wanted to touch on that, that your organization has been so helpful in, which is you're advocating for Christianity in, in, in regions where it, it's legitimately a threat of going extinct. And really, and, and we're very concerned about the situation, namely in Iraq and Syria. And so obviously in, in Syria right now, our number one, I mean, we've seen the Christian population decline by at least 50% uh, over the course of the Syrian civil war. Um, right now we're seeing that ISIS is resurging. We, we're also seeing um, Turkey and Turkish backed militias playing a very concerning role um, in particular uh, we've seen uh, Turkish-backed militias um, ethnic cleansing, as, as uh, Nobel Peace Prize winner Nadia Murad has stated, against uh, you know, Christians, Yazidis, Kurds, um, other, other communities as well. Um, as Amy Austin Holmes has pointed out, Council on Foreign Relations, Turkey's violated the U.S.-brokered ceasefire in northeastern Syria um, over 800 times, including over 120 violations in Tel Tamer. Uh, and so we're very concerned. And so we're, we are really looking for a strong response to this uh, from the U.S., but also we are looking, as it relates to Syria, for, for stronger U.S. engagement in the Northeast, where we do see religious freedom. Uh, we, we do see um, religious coexistence, you know, uh, at practice, uh, which is so crucial. Um, and then in Iraq, uh, we're very excited. Pope Francis is going to Iraq this week, and he's going to be meeting with with, with actually members of all religious communities, but he's especially going to be ministering to those who survived the ISIS genocide. Um, and, and the work here is, I mean, this is no easy task. We, we know that there were 1.5 million Christians in Iraq before, before 2003. Then after the war, the sectarianism and the genocide, there's less than 250,000 today. They're legitimately at threat of going extinct. And, and we've seen some great work done on this. Obviously, we work together to get the genocide recognized. We, we, we've seen strong uh, bipartisan engagement with folks such as uh, Vice President Mike Pence, Congresswoman Anna Eshoo, Congresswoman Hortonberry, uh, and many others uh, working together across the aisle and ushering in uh, U.S. assistance to genocide survivors. We, we've seen about $400 million go to genocide survivors uh, in Iraq and Syria. And so pushing for that to continue is huge. But another challenge that, we, that has to be looked at here is there is a security challenge and that Many Christians and Yazidis are internally displaced persons, and they, they actually cannot return home uh, because there are Iranian-backed militias that are occupying their communities. And surprise, surprise, we're also seeing that that, that Turkey has begun bombarding uh, parts close close to Sinjar on, on, under under you know with their kind of ongoing conflict with the with the PKK, and so that is preventing some Yazidis. Um, from also returning home. So there are big challenges, and also these communities. It's been years now they are devastated. And I think the Pope's visit is gonna bring hope. It's gonna show them that they're not forgotten. But in terms of what the US can do, these security challenges need attention and, and continuing uh, to provide assistance is, uh, is, is so vital. So uh, we're working hard there. And, and, and obviously there is a, you know, with, with regards to, to, to the Armenian people, there are historic presences of, of Armenians in both of these countries, obviously. So we know this is of significance to the ANCA as well. Yeah, no, uh, it's the, the, the horrors visited on all 
uh, Iraqis and, and Syrians. Um, I mean, have been a nightmare for us. The, the, the fate of our community in Aleppo has been particularly uh, devastating. I, um, I, I teach Sunday school at our local Armenian church, Stephen, and, and, I, and I know a lot of other Sunday school teachers around the country and a lot of other priests and a lot of other people who are active in our church and our community. So many of them uh, trace their roots back to Aleppo, to a, a city that welcomed genocide survivors um, after 1915. And it was, and it still is, uh, but to a lesser extent, like a wellspring of Armenian faith and community and, and um, identity. And to see uh, the horrors visited upon Aleppo uh, is terrible for the people of Aleppo, but will also have a ripple effect throughout our diaspora. It's, it's really uh, a, a great loss. And, you know, we're doing everything we can um, uh, to see the, the Syrian people recover. Uh, and, and among the Syrian people, uh, the Armenians, certainly in Aleppo and Damascus, in, in uh, Kesab, um, and, and elsewhere in Syria. We're, we're very, very devoted to that and deeply appreciative of IDC's work. Oh, it's, it's absolutely critical. And I mean, we are very grateful as well to be work, to be working with the prelates of the, of the Apostolic Church and the Eastern Prelacy, the Western Prelacy. And, uh, you know, I, it, it's been very touching meeting even members of your, especially of, of the Armenian Apostolic Church, clergy who are from Syria, lay people, you know, the stories that you hear are, are, are uh, they're unforgettable. Even I, I'm good friends with Sifan, who's on your staff at yeah. Al I remember him even sharing a story in Iraq once of, going to visit, I believe it was a seminary one day. This was during the conf you know, the war. And then a couple of days later, the, the seminary was, was no more, you know, blown to blown to rubble. So it's shocking. Yeah. Stephen, I, I, I think I should share this for some of our, our viewers who may not uh, know. The, the IDC has a, a religious advisory board, which uh, includes representation across the, sort of the broad spectrum of, 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 of faith leaders uh, in, the, in the Middle East. And, and as you mentioned, uh, uh, the prelates of the uh, Armenian Apostolic Church in the East and West, uh, um, His Holiness uh, Adam I, uh, uh, the Catholicos of Gilia in, in Lebanon, uh, has been a great partner of IDC. And that's just the Armenian component of it. I know that the, the, so many, it's really a remarkable group. And maybe it might be the most meaningful intersection between sort of the, the faith leadership of the Middle East and American politics or American policy making. It's, it's really, it's something that didn't exist for many years. And now that it, it exists, I ask myself, well, why didn't it always exist? And this is just another contribution that IDC has brought to, uh, to our discourse in Washington. Oh, it's absolutely, I mean, it's well said. And uh, that was a big challenge. And that's why IDC has always been about organization is rather, you know, Catholics, Orthodox, Protestants, uh, Eastern and Western uh, Christians, uh, I shouldn't even mention we have a member of our religious advisory board. We're, we're doing a, a roundtable conversation on the Pope's visit to Iraq this uh, Thursday at 11 a.m. And and really, what, what I'm really excited about is that obviously the Pope is Catholic, but we're converging a roundtable of, of folks from other other Christian traditions in Iraq to reflect on this visit and what it means. And so, uh, we are very happy about the work that we've been able to do in, in bringing people uh, together. Yeah, you're definitely and, definitely um, the religious roundtable for uh, uh, for the Middle East here in DC. That's awesome. Oh, yes, most certainly. And um, that really takes us to the last uh, the last bit of our work, which this last year has consumed most of our energy that we work together really closely with you guys. And that has been combating state sponsors of Christian persecution. And there, there's really three that we have our eyes fixated on at the moment that we're laser focused on. Uh, the first is gonna be Iran. And we're really concerned uh, especially with Iran's support for, for terrorist organizations across the region, such as Hezbollah in Lebanon and, and, and other militias in Iraq and Syria. Uh, you know, obviously in Lebanon, Hezbollah is possibly destabilizing the country or actively is destabilizing the country, but, but Lebanon's really at, at risk of, of becoming a failed state or imploding into conflict because of what Hezbollah is doing. Uh, but we're also seeing this, this, the same thing in Iraq and Syria. I mentioned about the, uh, the Iranian-backed militias in Iraq, but even, even in Syria, Iranian-backed forces have caused great devastation in the persecuted Christians. Um, the second country that we're really concerned about at the state level is Saudi Arabia. This may be the worst violator of religious freedom in the world. They completely prohibit um, the construction of, of churches, synagogues, temples in the country. 
Uh, with that being said, uh, this, this country even discriminates against its own Shia uh, minority. Uh, and it really, I mean, the, the reality is the United States of International Religious Freedom has been re recommending Saudi Arabia for a country of particular concern status, which, if accepted by the Secretary of State, should include sanctions. Uh, however, while the Secretary of State's been accepting this designation, there's been an indefinite waiver on sanctions against Saudi Arabia since 2004. And so many, many people in our community are very concerned about, obviously, the, the, the Khashoggi assassination, the war in Yemen. But we've been really telling people, if you want to really go to the root of what's wrong with this country and, and, and the lack of accountability, you have to go back about 15 years, at least. Um, and this problem needs to be addressed because the egregiousness of the religious freedom uh, issue in, in Saudi Arabia, it's unparalleled. I mean, there, there's no other country in the world where you see that type of repression where there's literally not one single church. And then the last country, and that we work very closely on this one, uh, is, is Turkey. And obviously it's ANCA, it's IDC, it's the Hellenic American Leadership Council and so many others. But what we saw from Turkey in 2020 was completely unacceptable. You know, converting, uh, you know, obviously the core church, the Agia Sophia, you know, into, into mosques. You know, Christians, the Christians who were not killed or forcibly, you know, displaced or fled Turkey during the genocide, Namely, that's like 0.2% of Turkey's population now is Christian. Um, and it's over 98% Muslim. And so the idea that you would need to convert two churches that are, you know, almost 2,000 years old uh, is, 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 is just an egregious offense to cultural heritage. But even Erdogan calling Christians uh, remnants of the sword, a non-pejorative term in Turkish, is unacceptable. We've talked about what Turkey's done in Syria, but even taking, because in Syria, the, these Turkish-backed militias, they're jihadist militias. And even uh, Michael Rubin with the American Enterprise Institute and the Rojab Information Center, they, there's a list of former ISIS fighters who are fighting in Turkish militias. These are not, I mean, there was a lot of misinformation that was going on about who the who these forces were, but we know who they are now. And it's it's been incredibly concerning seeing Turkey even transport these forces to, to Artsakh and they were used to fight and they were used to commit an onslaught against uh, a Christian population, an Armenian population that had, that goes back, uh, you can tell this better than I could, but at least the first century AD. And I just, I'll never forget how shocking it was to have um, the Archbishop of Artsakh, you were able to arrange for him to speak at IDC summit last September. And he just gave a general message about the situation. And one week later, they were being shelled. Uh, it, it just it's just remarkable. And so what we're seeing with Turkey is just there's a need for accountability. The U.S. needs to call Turkey out and call Erdogan specifically out for promoting religious bigotry and prejudice. Um, and then also this, this this issue of supporting terrorism is a, it's a national security issue. Uh, and so the work that you guys th have done, this has been pioneering. We we, we, we learn from you. We, we love working with you on it. And it, it's a top, top priority for us in 2021. Absolutely. And, and Stephen, I, I uh, cannot express, words will not um, do justice to the appreciation and the gratitude we feel to IDC. Um, going back to the, the battle for the, the passage of the genocide resolution, um, those, these are tough battles. In, 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 in D.C., you go up against the, some pretty heavy hitters and you make some enemies, and uh, IDC did not uh, shy away at all, and, and they shoulder to shoulder and uh, high marks. A plus, um, and then on Artsakh, this, 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 the same is true. Um, IBC uh, stood with us in defending the indigenous Armenian Christian population uh, of Artsakh uh, during um, uh, the attack by Azerbaijan, backed by Turkey, backed by uh, mercenaries, ISIS-backed uh, mercenaries. Uh, not a lot of people did that. Not a lot of people did that. That was um, there were a lot of people who were afraid uh, to take sides. Uh, IBC did not shy away from standing on the side of truth. And, and, and freedom and faith and the, the right of people to, 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 to live on their ancient homeland, to practice um, uh, their faith. Uh, IBC stood shoulder to shoulder with the Armenians in our, in our time of really the, the, the greatest crisis we faced in, in at least a generation. And for that, we're, we're very, very grateful. And uh, we hope to bring that same level of commitment and devotion uh, to the full range of issues on the, the IDC agenda. And just as, as, as Armenians were, were grateful, 
right? And we, you know, we appreciate the, the work of IDC. Uh, so too must we add our voices to the work that, that IDC is doing. And then they have, um, you know, obviously a, a pro Armenian aspect of their of their uh, their work uh, and and support that for sure. But also the other issues help the uh, the population in Syria and Iraq and deal with the, the Saudi issue and the, and the Lebanon issue. All these are in a sense. Um, uh, Armenian issues as well, because the, the fate of Armenians in that region uh, is not decided um, uh, um, as like silo. It's not something that's uh, set apart from the rest of the region. Uh, if we see um, the trends that are currently in place continue about the, the destruction of uh, the Christian uh, presence in, in this part of the world, if we see intolerance uh, unchecked, uh, it, this will eventually uh, you know, these horrors will be visited upon Armenia. So it's both in our interest, but it's also the right thing to do. So uh, I, I do encourage all those listening today, all those within earshot of this video and, and, and wherever it's shared across social media uh, to, to sign up with IDC, uh, to help IDC as an activist, as a donor, as a volunteer. Uh, I know that Stephen, you have uh, chapters across uh, the country that would certainly welcome the participation of, of, of all you know, supporters, including Armenian supporters. So perhaps you could tell us about like, what are some of the different ways uh, between chapters and, 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 and financial support and activism that, that, um, that folks can be helpful to IDC? It's a great question. Uh, we really encourage people to do three things. That's pray, act, and give. So uh, obviously prayer straight up, you know, that is the most basic thing that we ask of people. Um, and our, our brothers and sisters in the Middle East need it. Uh, when it comes to action, I encourage people, the most basic thing you can do that takes less than a minute is you can go to indefenseofchristians.org and there's a take action tab. If you click on it, you'll find all the action alerts that we have. And you'll see on the website now, there's an action alert, tell President Biden to recognize the Armenian genocide. Tell Congress to support Coptic Christians. Tell Congress to recognize the Simile massacre and other issues. And we continue to update that. So make sure that you're taking action on those issues. And if you want to even uh, become more active, uh, we have uh, chapters across the country that you can join. And my colleague, uh, Sarah Basile, uh, who does a great job, not only with our communications and our social media, but she also does a fantastic job uh, with our chapters as well. So you can go on our website and, and reach out to her. And she's a fun person to work with. Your advocates would have a great time um, getting organized with her. And then uh, the last thing is just giving. And that is uh, every, you know, each, each person's situation is different, uh, but obviously if you're, if you're praying, if you're acting, uh, you know, your support means the world and, and no one can say this better than you, Aram, or attest to this better than you, but we are small nonprofit organizations and we are going head to head with giant, massive lobbying firms. I mean, the Turks, the Egyptians, the Gulf states, these guys shell out serious money and they get former members of Congress, former high level staffers uh, to go and, and spread basically false messaging to our governments. And it's up to us. We're the ones who are fighting against that. And so, you know, I think that you would understand this better than anyone. But supporting groups like Anka, supporting groups like IDC uh, is so incredibly important. And I, I do just want to say as well that um, I think the work that, that that's been done is, is is incredible. And I mean, I give all the credit as well to our president, to Tofik Baklini, uh, to yourself, Aram. But we have we have some great staffs. So I've mentioned Sarah. We've got Rich Gazelle on our team. I know Elizabeth, Teresa, uh, Sepan, nurses who's managing this call. You guys, I mean, we are an all-star team uh, fighting together for this, for these issues. And so it's uh, it's all the more important that we continue to invest in our organization so we can continue adding uh, players to that all-star team. I 100% I, I agree, Stephen. Uh, sometimes I don't know where uh, ANCA uh, ends and IDC begins. I feel like we are one one team and one family. And every dollar that gets donated to IDC is a major, major force multiplier. Uh, as Stephen said, the opposition is intense. But because the message, is, um, because the message resonates so powerly uh, and because there's, there's, there's spirit behind it and truth behind it, um, and really hardworking people behind it, it is just immensely powerful. In a city like Washington, where sometimes things get, uh, you know, the coin of the realm is, is, is PAC donations and lobbying dollars, uh, IDC in a sense operates at a level above that because they're, they're just so manifestly on the right side of the issues that uh, they just bring, you know, I don't know, the, the Holy Spirit to our struggle. And uh, 
so every dollar that's invested, every every hour that's invested of time, every uh, meeting, every uh, Zoom call, every uh, everything that you can bring to the table through Sarah and others uh, really, really makes a difference. And I think that you know, it, the, the, the sea change that we've seen over the last seven years since IBC uh, was founded, I think I think th those were like, that's like the, uh, the precursor to an even brighter future and even more powerful uh, destiny for the work that IBC is doing. So uh, with that, Stephen, I just want to invite you to say, um, uh, share a couple of, of, of closing remarks. Thank you so much for being with us today. Thank you so much for all the work that you do and Tufik and Sarah and Rich and, and the rest of your remarkable team. But I'll, I'll leave the, uh, the, the final word to you uh, along with my, my sincere thanks. Yeah, well, you know, what I think what, what all of us just want to say is, you know, we, we consider you all to be, to be family uh, as well. Um, we're very excited to work with you this year, whether it's um, advocating for support for Armenia, um, aid uh, for, for, you know, for the people of Artsakh, uh, accountability uh, towards Turkey. Um, we're, we're here, we're ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with you. Um, we're, we're gonna push really hard this year um, for President Biden uh, to recognize the Armenian genocide as well. And we're gonna continue to, to combat all, all actors across the world uh, who seek to deny it. I wanted just to, to, to share with people who are watching as well that on Friday, March 19th at, at 1 p.m., um, Anka IDC and the Hellenic American Leadership Council are gonna be doing a policy briefing that's open to the public about how the U.S. can combat Turkey as it relates to, to spreading religious bigotry and, and directly persecuting Christians and their support of terrorism. Uh, and so we're really hoping to, to change U.S. policy as it relates to Turkey. It's important. So that, that event's coming up on Friday, March 19th. Um, our website is indefenseofchristians.org. And uh, I, I just say, I, I can't speak highly enough of the work that the ANCA does. So to all of you who are watching and who are watching through the ANCA Facebook page or Twitter, just know that you're involved with a great organization. And um, I'm, it's been a pleasure sharing about what IDC does as well. We'd love to have you stand with us as well. Thank you so much, Stephen. Thank you for all of you, uh, to all of you for listening. And uh, we'll be back online again soon. Thank you.